morning, everybody. The, um, I just wanted to understand here, who is non-American in the audience? It's a better question to ask who is American. So that's OK, this morning I thought. So you're half, half, more or less? And you're all in HR? Legal and HR, the two of them, OK. And all, how many different companies, more or less? Are they American-based companies or also foreign companies? Or foreign? How many are foreign-based headquarters? OK. Just so I calibrate a little bit, but it sounds like you're really a global audience. And I have the awful task to be the last speaker, I've been told. <laughs> Yesterday, we were in Denmark for the fashion industry. And I'll tell you in a minute why the fashion industry and why that's so important. But um, unfortunately, I was told, you know, you're the keynote speaker. You have to kick it off. I said, fine. But uh, here comes the Princess Royal, so you have to let her go first. Then. The lady who uh, opened the conference, so you have to let her go. She clearly read my speech because she basically did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was someone else in between. So by the time it was my turn, I said, you know, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> my, my speech was useless. And now I was working yesterday night because of uh, jet lag. I couldn't really sleep that much. So I thought I'll make a speech. And I was out with Ariana Huffington doing some things. And I, from the car, I sent it. Nothing has arrived. So. I go downstairs and they said, yeah, we have a speech for you. It's already, it's a totally different thing. I don't know what the person is going to do who actually wrote that speech, but it has nothing to do with what you guys are working. So here I am, you know, I feel like the emperor was out close. <laughs> Yesterday I was at the airport flying from uh, Copenhagen to uh, Newark, and I heard three people talk in the corner. And I know it's very impolite to listen to people, but I know you do, so I don't mind sharing it either. And I quickly discovered that one was a doctor, one was an engineer, and one was an economist. And they clearly were bragging. When you get three guys in a corner, they start bragging. So the engineer, the doctor said, you know, we have the oldest profession. So why is this? Well, if you go back to the book of Genesis, and Eve came out of the rib of, uh, of Adam, both of them survived. It's uh, first successful operation. Doctors are the oldest profession. So the engineer said, you must be kidding. I think the engineers are the oldest profession. Because uh, when there was chaos, we started organizing that. We created the universe. Uh, anybody that is well placed to make uh, something organized out of chaos, it's engineers. So we have the oldest profession. And then the economist said, no, I don't think so. I think we have the oldest profession. Because who created chaos in the first place? <laughs> And I think that is where we are a little bit. That's probably a good opening to my talk. You know, Charles Dickens wrote this book, The Tale of Two Cities, in 1859. He was talking about Paris and London at that time. And he was saying, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. It's the spring of hope, and it's the winter of despair. And I think that reflects probably very well where we are currently on the global scene. And I'll bring it back to you and your professions as I go along. But it reflects probably well where we are. Never ever have we lifted so many people out of poverty. In the last 50 years, our GDP has grown about sixfold. The population is growing threefold. Koviannam, not far from here at the UN, started in 2000 that Ian was referring to the Millennial Development Goals. Had a simple objective to halve the number of people living in poverty. At that time, it was defined as $1.25 a day. And lo and behold, they actually achieved it 15 years later. China, a big part of it, but also many other parts of the world. Every day, 215,000 people are lifted out of poverty. Every day, over 300,000 people are getting access to clean drinking water and sanitation. Paternal health is better. More women, actually, are participating in the workforce. People live longer. More people access to water and sanitation. It's a good time to be born. It's a good time to be born. So I would start from that optimism. Often I hear people say, oh, we messed it up so much, the next generation, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If I'm the next generation, I'd be pretty happy, to be honest. We've done a reasonably great job. Unfortunately, though, the crisis in 2006, 2007, which had some of its origin in the city that we're in right now, what some people call it the subcrime crisis, and crisis that was a financial crisis, you might call it, that became an economic crisis. I would argue it has spread around the world as a political crisis, ultimately was a crisis of morality, in my opinion. We started to discover then, because before that, when the stock market goes up every 
year six, seven, eight, nine percent, nobody's asking themselves questions. But when the crash came, people said, what is going on? And we discovered that a system of, uh, our economic system of growth probably wasn't a sustainable system, depending on heavy levels of debt at private level and at government level. Overconsumption. And frankly, leaving too many people behind. What people discovered at the time of the crisis, for sure, was that banks were too big to fail, but they also discovered that people were too small to matter. And they started to realize, obviously, the internet and technology helping as well, that their situation was not really the situation that some other people found themselves in. Transparency of the internet made a lot of people question a little bit what was going on, including the political order. And from that, you've seen a very big disruption, I would say, in the global governance systems that we're in, in the political systems, and actually, frankly, in the private sector and many of the companies that you operate in. It's tough to be a CEO right now. I was 10 years a CEO, but the average tenure of a CEO is now less than four and a half years. The only one that wasn't happy with the 10 years was my wife, I guess. An average length of a publicly traded company in the US where data are available was 67 years when I was born and it's now 17 years. And the thing is going down and down and down. You could argue, and this is where you come in for sure, is that we don't have the right leaders to deal with these challenges that we're facing currently in the economy. The biggest challenges, in my opinion, for the interest of time, we can talk about many challenges, but the biggest challenges are basically two if you believe it or not, but the first one is climate change. And fortunately, 98% of the world is believing it, believe me, despite what some people are trying to make you believe. But, but we have climate change as a burning issue and income inequality. If we don't address these, I see Peter sitting there, I haven't said hello. If we don't address these, then we really have a big problem. On climate change, we're well on the trajectory to 3.2% warming. We came from a trajectory that actually was higher, but the COP21, which was in Paris in 2016, bent that curve, actually. Also, technology. You have now many places in the world where solar or wind is much cheaper than the conventional fossil fuel, for example. It's really moving fast, actually. But despite that, we are well off uh, track. 18 of the last 20 years were the hottest years on record. We've just passed 415 parts per uh, 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 in, in the air in terms of pollution. We've never seen that. The Living Planet report that came out in the, in the fall last year talks about us losing species at the rate of a thousand times more than the historic patterns. We are playing with Mother Earth. And Mother Earth, frankly, doesn't negotiate, but it does send us the invoices. This country alone would have had about 300 billion last year alone in extra damages because of your droughts, hurricanes, floods, and and fires, actually. In many of the uh, parts of the world, because of global warming, we're starting to get into a negative feedback loop. The permafrost melting, methane, which is much more dangerous being released. And once you get into the negative feedback loop, which we're starting to see happen equally with the oceans, etc., it's very difficult to change. Not far from here is Canada. There's a philosopher called Hubert Reeves. And Hubert said it very well in one of his books when he said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature. Not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. That is basically what we are doing. Deforestation last year up 71%, the size of a country of Australia. We're literally playing with the lungs of the world. Sure, it's the vertebrates now in terms of species, but soon it's our turn. It's not a battle of us versus modern nature. It's a battle for our survival. Modern nature would be very happy if we were gone at the rate we're going. It's actually bizarre if you think about that. As human beings in the last 30 years, more or less, we've done more damage to this planet than in its five billion years of existence. I only ask myself a very simple question. What really gives us the right to do that? What gives us the right to deprive ourselves of future generations from the opportunities that we've had, that all of our forefathers have had? Our consumption patterns are totally unsustainable. 
Climate change is obviously the most important one, but think about our consumption patterns, where 86% of the plastic that we produce loses its value after one usage. Where food production, which is responsible for 60% of the deforestation, where we're able to produce a food system where still today 840 million people go to bed hungry, not even knowing if, wake, if they wake up the next day. Whilst at the same time we have the audacity to waste 30 to 40 percent of the food we produce. If food production, a food loss, if food loss would be a country, it would be the third biggest carbon emitter after China and the US. And that consumption pattern is only done by one and a half billion people out of the 7.8 billion that are fortunate enough to live in my parts of the world. I'm from the Netherlands or Western Europe or in this part of the world. And the sad thing is the others aspire to live like us. It just doesn't add up. And then I haven't even talked about income inequality. For the first time in the history of mankind, last year, the bottom 3.8 million people in this world saw their combined net wealth go down by 11%. These are the poorest people in the world. $1.90, $1.75 a day. We don't even know how to live with that. Don't even imagine that. Probably have never met them. And the billionaires, just taking the billionaires. So their combined wealth last year go up by 12%. Minus 11 12%. The combined wealth increase of the billionaires was 900 billion. It's more than two and a half billion a day. That's their increase. If you would just take that money, you can send all the 246 million children to school that don't have education currently. You probably could save seven, eight million people a, life, a year by just providing them basic health care. The system is basically broken. In this country, the excellence of capitalism over half the people don't believe in it anymore. They just simply say it's not working for us. And finally, some people are speaking up. You know, People actually, that I don't know how much they do about it, but all of a sudden you see a quote from Larry Fink or from Jamie Dimon and some others who want to be famous or perhaps they get closer to, to their death and want to be remembered for something good. But people are starting to question what we're doing here. I would argue that any system where too many people are not participating, or feeling that they are left behind, would ultimately rebel against itself. Not different from employees in our companies. That's why you see the yellow fest, that's why you see the Extinction Rebellion, that's why you see the movements coming up here from, you had your Wall Street movement, now you have your Green Deal, and other things. That will only increase. The first reaction of citizens of this world, in many places of the world, was to elect different politicians. Ideally, to elect non-politicians. You certainly got your fair share in this country, and I congratulate you for that. But the next thing will be that these populist governments that are voted in all over the world, by the way, are certainly not delivering on these wishes of consumers or citizens of this world, which increasingly are becoming shorter term, their expectations, and they're going to reject them as well. Phase two will be coming. We'd better be ready to figure out what economic system we need what economic system we want. I can tell you one thing. The challenges that we have are probably three or four that I would point out that we do need to address. And the clock is ticking. We need to decarbonize our global economy. We're carbon junkies. We frankly don't know how to grow without carbon. But science tells us that we need to be net zero by 2050. In the next 15 years of 40%, absolute reduction, despite the population growth, despite the growth of the middle class. We need to be net zero by 2050 if we want to have a speck of a chance to stay below one and a half degrees. We need to move from a linear consumption model, which is basically dig in the ground, stuff it in a factory, use it, and dump it on a landfill or increasingly in the oceans, to a circular, or I would argue, a regenerative model. Right now, in this world, every year, we hit World Consumption Day, which is where the maximum consumption that the world can replenish for the whole year 
is now August 1. Anything after August is borrowing from the planet. If it's August 1, we are consuming about 70% more than our natural planet can replenish every year. We need to move to a circular, or I would call it a regenerative system. Every second, a truckload of garments, one of the reasons I was in Copenhagen, gets dumped in incineration landfills or in the oceans. And the numbers go up because we seem to like fast fashion. Every minute, a truckload of plastics get dumped in the ocean. We're on a trajectory now of having more plastics in the ocean than fish by 2050. In fact, I have good news for you. Any fish you buy right now has most likely a 90% chance of having plastic in it. Decarbonize our global economy, move to a circular or regenerative economy. I would argue we also want to move the financial markets to the longer term. We've all been CEOs or worked with the CEOs or are in the C-suites. You cannot solve the issues of food security or poverty or climate change or the broader issues of inclusion if you don't get a little bit more breathing space than the quarterly reporting. The red race of squeezing out returns is killing our businesses. That's why you see the 67 years when I was born to 17 years now, length of a publicly traded company. Any business just run for the shareholders is really not set up to be there for the longer term. A minoptic focus on shareholders is a frightening thing that has crept into our economic systems. It used to be that our economic system was subservient to the financial market. We invented money to make it easier to trade with each other. It doesn't only feel, it is now true, that our economic system has become subservient to the financial market. Kind of frightening. Our global economy is about $100 trillion around it. We've created financial instruments to the equivalent of about six to $700 trillion. Sure, I understand the farmer wants a forward contract and you have a derivative market, but don't tell me that we need six times more than the global economy. And all that money is chasing returns, trying to find someone who takes it off you at a higher price than you've paid for it. It's become very dysfunctional, actually. And yet, we are not capable of dealing with that. So we need to move the financial markets to the longer term. And then finally, we need to create an economic system that is more inclusive. It has nothing to do with being a communist or a, or a socialist. You know, billionaires don't wash their hair more often. Billionaires don't eat more marmalade on their bread. A more inclusive economy would be to the benefit of all of us. Now, historically, we have relied on governments. We elected democratically elected governments, good people. We were proud of them. We aspired to be one day, perhaps even one of them. But what has happened, unfortunately, is that global governance is broken, not the least because we're still relying on institutions that were established in 1944 at the time of Bretton Woods. The OECD, the World Bank, the WTO, or its forerunners, IMF. The world has moved on. Anybody here who's working in a company has probably had 15, 20, or 30 strategies since 1944. The issues are getting more global. Cybersecurity, financial markets, climate change, and our governance is shrinking increasingly to the local or in some cases even subnational levels. We simply don't have a mechanism to deal with this anymore. Now we can sit here, can be cynical or Skeptical about our politicians. Create more jokes than there are already in the world. Make them look ridiculous. But they've been good to us, to bring us this far. Isn't it time that we then step up the plate and try to help de-risk the political process? Now, it's a call of duty to all of us. And frankly, it needs the private sector. You will not be able to create a new system if you don't have the private sector behind it. In most countries, it's about 60% of the global economy, 80% of the job creation, 90% of the financial flow. It's not easy to do, I understand that. But are we going to sit here and just let this happen? Or are we saying we're in a position of responsibility to do something about it? We're going to decide what the course of history is going to be.
and bend the curve. Now, it's overwhelming. It's clearly overwhelming for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, again, not far from here at the UN, in September 2015, another wonderful thing happened, which is that 193 countries went together. 193 countries, including the United States, for that matter. And they signed the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the sequence or the, the, the follow-up to these Millennial Development Goals that I talked about. The Millennial Development Goals were basically focused on the emerging markets and had eight goals. Now, we need to really look at our total global economy. We have 17 goals. Goal number one, poverty alleviation. Goal number two, food security. Goal number 13, climate change. Goal number four, education. Goal number 16, peace and justice. Deals with corruption, rule of law. Goal number 17, partnership. I'll talk about it in a minute. 17 goals. This is a very simple objective, by the way. To irreversibly eradicate poverty, and to do that in a more sustainable and equitable way. What's wrong with that? To not leave anybody behind. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And frankly, we understand the complexity. 17 goals, 169 targets. Difficult for any CEO to get their arms around it. The average CEO, if you're lucky, remembers the name of his wife, what business he's in, and how much money he makes, let alone 17 goals. But we boiled it down, and we just looked at energy systems, cities, food and land use, and health and well-being. There was a commission, and translating that into the business language, like we know how to do as CEOs, we found an opportunity that is worth at least $12 trillion, and a 380 million job creation, just in those four sectors alone. At the time, believe me, with the fourth industrial revolution breathing in our necks, that we do need the job creation soon. I would argue now that the, the implementation of these SDGs is estimated to cost us about three to five trillion dollars a year. Sounds like a lot of money to me for sure, but it's only three to five percent of the global economy, if you remember what I said before. Are we willing to bet the future of humanity on 3 to 5%? Now, here's the funny thing. In fact, it's not even funny. It's probably my jet lag that made the word funny come out. But here's the sad thing. That on each of these 17 goals, I would argue right now, that we are already incurring costs that are higher than the implementation of the overall goals. You get what I'm saying? Goal number five is gender equality. It's not one country in the world, by the way, that women have the same rights as men. It will take over 200 years at the current trajectory to get equal pay. I'm not even talking about the number of CEOs or boards of directors. According to McKinsey, just giving women the same access to education, financing, land rights, would unlock the global economy by $26 trillion. Goal number 16 I talked about is peace and justice. This world is capable right now to spend 10 to 12% of its GDP on conflict prevention and wars. That itself is two to three times more than the implementation of the overall sustainable development goals. Remember goal number 13, anybody? Goal number 13, climate action deals with climate change. According to the IMF, the cost that we are now incurring as a result of climate change is already over $5.3 trillion a year. Again, more than the implementation of the overall goals. And what really gets to me is these 846 million people that go to bed hungry not knowing if they wake up the next day. It only takes 10% of the food that we waste to ensure that these people don't go to bed hungry. But we're not capable of doing any of this. And then we call ourselves the most intelligent species. Something to think about. At Unilever, we said very simply, if you look at what is happening in the world, and I became a CEO in 2000, uh, at the end of 2008, the world obviously wasn't in very good shape, nor was the company. I was the first CEO coming in from the outside and we needed to get our growth back. 
But we said we have to do it differently. We have to ensure that if we want to be around and not in these statistics of many of these companies that are disappearing like hot dogs, we have to be sure that we have a reason for being. I often ask CEOs in the different bodies that I'm involved in, what's the purpose of your business? And they start stuttering. The color in their face is changing. If you don't know what the purpose is of your business, what's the purpose of your being here in the first place? A business without purpose has no purpose. I would even argue that the only way businesses can survive longer term, if you're interested in surviving long term, if you just want to play the short term game and earn a lot of money very quickly and don't care about it, it's a different story. But broadly, our economy is built on the longer term thinking. You'd agree with me on that. That if you want to be around for the longer term, you better think of your business model now anymore, not anymore being less bad, which is basically the CSR uh, territory. But you think of your business model really hard of how can you have a positive impact, a net positive impact in society. Because if you won't have that positive impact, why would the citizens of this world, myself included, let you be around? The reason I was at the fashion industry is not because I'm a fashionista. I'm actually the opposite. I still wear my sweaters for my college days. But the fashion industry is actually the first or second most polluting industry that we have in the world. It accounts for 10% of global warming alone, and in its current trajectory in the next 15 years, will be 20% of the incremental uh, carbon emissions. It creates 37% of the plastics in the oceans because of the fibers that are being washed in your machines. In fact, cutting into the food chain. It's a major destructor of biodiversity in the way it grows its cotton and some of the other crops. In fact, 23% of the world's pesticides are used by the fashion industry. And you would agree with me, after the Rana Plaza, disaster in Bangladesh, that the social compliance in the fashion industry, where uh, at least 300 million people make their living, is not something to write home about. In fact, in Rana Plaza, these women knew that they were going into a collapsing factory. The cracks were on the wall. They didn't have a choice. You know why they didn't have a choice? 1,150 innocent women lost their lives, by the way, when that happened. Because they got paid 11 cents an hour. 11 cents an hour is about the closest you can get to modern day slavery. The next best country at that time in the world was Vietnam at 26 cents an hour. We killed those people. We killed them because we thought it was cool to buy a $1 t-shirt. Basically what it boils down to. So if we don't change these industries and start to think about what it takes to make them positive contributors, then these industries themselves are in danger, or humanity, if you look at the broader, bigger picture. So we said, let's decouple our growth from environmental impact, totally, and let's increase our overall social impact. We put 50 targets behind that, because I believe in the end of the day, and someone was quoting the Edelman Trust Barometer when I came in, uh, trust is very low in institutions and in business and CEOs. And the only way that we come out of that and rebuild trust is to walk the talk, obviously, to close the say-do gap, but more importantly, to work on the much higher levels of transparency. Transpar transparency builds trust, and trust is obviously the basis of prosperity. So we put 50 targets out there, and these targets are monitored, and they're audacious targets. First of all, for a company itself, how do we ensure that all of the materials we buy are sustainably sourced? How do we ensure as a company that we stick to the ruggy framework, that we don't have child labor or slave labor in our value chain? We currently, unfortunately, because of the political conflicts, have 126 million refugees. And many of them are women, vulnerable, passports taken away, ending in sex trade. It happens in every country, by the way. None of it excluded, excluded, including this one. Without getting sidetracked, just two little facts in case you ever pay trivial pursuit. The human caravan that is moving to this country from Latin America is not because you're such a great country. It's because of desperation. I took a Peruvian fisherman who fish in one hour to make his livelihood, takes him now more than a day. The coffee or the cocoa grows, their prices have collapsed 
because of global warming. And if you're still interested in the war in Syria, which seems to have become a soap opera on television without attracting any action from anybody anymore, it had its origins actually in climate change. But major droughts two to three years before the spark exploded was because people were moving to the cities. We're paying a hefty price for our irresponsibilities. So what is your corporate responsibility? Is it the Ruggy framework? It took me three years to convince the global consumer goods industry, the major retailers and manufacturers, to even sign up to the basic principles of business and human rights, which, by the way, have been created or are around already for over 70 years. By not signing that, you're basically saying that you're in agreement to have child labor and slave labor. If you're in agreement, would you like your children to be in those situations? It's basically what you're saying. It is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. How we think as industries that we can outsource our supply chains and by doing so also outsource our responsibilities. It doesn't work anymore. Not far from here is the Statue of Liberty. Viktor Frankl in his book Man's Search for Meaning said it very well towards the end when he said when they built the Statue of Liberty on the east coast of the United States, they forgot to build the Statue of Responsibility on the west coast. You cannot have your liberty and freedom to do all these things and build our businesses and be successful if you don't take that responsibility with it. And then you need to look at your products. In a consumer goods company like ours, we're in 190 countries, two and a half billion consumers a day use our products. The brands are an ideal vehicle. Any brand should have a purpose. We're not selling the world's leading toilet bowl cleaner just to make money. We're selling it to attack the issues of open defecation. We're building 25 million toilets. That's the most important KPI. We have 25% of the world's tea market. We're not just selling tea to make money. I'm in the tea business because I want to prove that these people can have a decent livelihood and send their kids to school, can have energy at their home coming from solar, and have a clean cooking stove so they don't die before the age of 50, can have a simple bar of soap at home so their kids make it past the age of five, which still isn't the case for four million of them. Frankly, it could have been us. Every brand should have a purpose. For us, actually, interestingly, the brands that even have a stronger purpose grow faster and are more profitable because they're much more connected with the realities of the world where there are enormous challenges, turn challenges around enormous opportunities. Incredible. A brand like Dove in my 10 years has grown every year 7 8%. It fights for women's self-esteem. I'm sure everybody can make a product like Dove. We don't like to say that publicly. But at the end of the day, it's what a brand stands for is far more important nowadays than just its simple functional, uh, its functionality. People increasingly want to buy what a brand stands for. The whole premise of that is one of our brands at Ben & Jerry's, totally built on activism. Everybody can make an ice cream for heaven's sake and put some chunks in for that matter. <laughs> Although, by the way, one of the best ice cream flavors, if you've ever had that, is peach and mint. Has anybody had ice cream that is peach and mint? Wonderful. In fact, we just introduced it in the US. We call it impeachment. <laughs> As you can understand, very popular with half of your population, but not so with the other half. That's why we stay in Vermont. It seems to work there. But every brand should have a purpose and be part of creating a movement. <coughs> And if you are, you'll be successful. The fastest growing companies are the B Corps right now. The market is rapidly moving in food to organics and bios, much faster than any of these big guys can, can, can catch up with. Consumers are folding. Most of the millennials are purpose-driven and want to put their money there. And the great news is about 30 trillion of value is being transferred from our generations to the next generation. They're going to spend it a little bit more responsibly. You better be ready for that. Many companies complain that they can't attract people to their companies or that they don't have millennials buy their products it's because they've put themselves in a position of irrelevance. Be careful there because it's happening. We're all sitting there probably as boiling frogs in a pan without really knowing that. Bringing purpose to business has done another thing for us. 
It has made us the preferred employer in basically all the markets we operate. It has made us attract over 2 million people a year that apply to our company. The third most looked up company in LinkedIn after Google and Apple. Our engagement scores, despite an enormous pressure, have continued to stay in the top tercile of the top tercile. People want to work for a company where they can make a difference in life, where they can leave this world in a little bit better place than they found it. We have 170,000 people on the payroll and many millions indirectly in our value chain. 170,000 people on the payroll is a lower payroll than the bonuses that were paid in the city in London last year. But I look at outside of my office window. And the city of London is complaining that they can't attract people, that Basel III and other things has made it less attractive to work in the financial sector. That bonuses are higher than our total salary bill. We don't have a problem attracting people. There's something that purpose unlocks that the next generation understands. It obviously helps you cut costs. You know, it's much more motivating for people to fight food waste because people go to bed hungry than one of these CEOs saying, I need a savings program because we need to make more money. I can assure you that in our system, we take more food waste out of the system than in any other cost savings program that we've had at Nauseam in any of our companies over our careers. It drives innovation. If you want to build 25 million toilets and you go to the poor countries, you discover they don't have water. Again, flush their toilets. You get insights. You develop products that make more sense. You'll be more successful. And in our case, actually, it attracted a lot of companies to us. We have made 52 acquisitions because you have to be sure that you're in the markets of the future. But many of them came to us. A wonderful brand is Seven's Generation. We said, how can we help you? Because we were not in the U.S. in laundry and household cleaning, and we thought it would be a good thing to be in there and stir the pot a little bit and not just give it to our competitors. But we said, how can, you, how can we help you? Let us come back to you. And they came back to you and said, yeah, you can not only help you, help us. We just want to be part of you, want to be part of you. These B Corps, these benefit-driven corporations, fit very well in our models. We've bought five or six last year alone. So it works. Now, here is my question to you as HR people, or as legal people, or as very simply citizens of this world. I believe that we don't need to send more people to Pluto or Mars to find the answers. I believe we actually don't need more PhDs in due respect to find the answers. We know how to build houses. We know how to grow food, clearly. We now also know how to make green energy, by the way. The Energy Transition Commission, by the way, issued a report that to completely convert our economic system to green energy between now and 2050 is only 0.5% of GDP, far less than the benefits or the costs we would incur if we don't do it. We know all these things, and yet collectively we don't do it. Collectively we don't do it. And the thing that is missing really is human willpower, leadership. Courageous leadership. The word courage comes from the friend's word heart. It doesn't come from the brain. It's really a simple question. Do we care? That's where the courage comes in. Having enough courage to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Not needing to have all these answers, but knowing that what you're going for is the right thing. That's what courage really means. You have to work with the brain and the heart. And frankly, in many of our businesses, in society, we just simply lost humanity. We send 50 billion likes to each other. We commit suicides if we don't get enough likes. But the average American has only one friend they can really talk to. In Britain, we've just appointed a minister for loneliness. Soon we'll all be living in the cities. Already now, there are very few kids that know the difference between an aubergine and a cucumber. How can we distance ourselves from modern nature if we can never make humanity survive long term if modern nature isn't there in the first place? The question simply is, do we care? And how do we get more people to care? How do we get more leaders that are purpose-driven? 
Leaders that can think longer term. Leaders that can work in partnership with others. Because it's very clear that the definition of Einstein of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is not happening anymore. We have to snap out of that, create new coalitions, make some things pre-competitive. Get our lawyers to work to really define a little bit broader what we can and should be doing. And should be doing. We need leaders that not only are just human beings, but that understand actually the essence of goal 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals, to put the interests of others ahead of their own. Knowing that by doing so, by the way, they'll be better off. There's still too many people that think greed is good, but ultimately generosity is going to win. Leaders with a high level of awareness of what is going on in the world, but also an appetite to engage. And doing that with a little bit of a sense of humanity and humility is really what I'm talking about. Now, I believe you are those leaders, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here. But let me end by a very simple thing. You're darn lucky to be here. Darn lucky. You had access to bar soap, so you made it past the age of five. Someone gave you enough nutrition in your first thousand days so your brain didn't end up being stunted for the rest of your lives. You clearly found a way to get education. In my country, I was born in a family of six. My parents were deprived of high school and university because of the Second World War. I wouldn't be standing here if my country wouldn't have given me the free education. You have a level of financial independence. You can work and live where you want. Well, I have good news for you. If you fit those descriptions, then you basically have won the lottery ticket of life. What did you do for it? You could argue your parents a little bit, but not much. You could have been born in any of the other countries and fallen under the statistics. You belong to 2% of the world population. And if you belong to the 2% of the world population that has won the lottery ticket of life, then it is your duty, it is your duty to put yourself to the service of the other 98%. It was the Dalai Lama who said it well, that if you seek enlightenment just for yourself to enhance your own causes, you miss purpose. But if you seek enlightenment to ensure that others reach their courses, their, co their courses, you are with purpose. So my simple message to you is live a life with purpose. Thank you very much.